let me just, uh, for that quick little break there, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Francis Smith. He's a professor of radiology at the University of Aberdeen. In fact, I think one of his uh, achievements was, I think it's safe to say, he had the first clinical practice in MRI back, I think, in 1980 in Europe, uh, which kind of meshes nicely with the fact, and I think I'm correct in saying this, that Dr. Bradley had the first clinical practice in MRI in the United States, although that's my impression in any case. So we've got some real pioneers here. The other thing I, I, I should point out is in 1998, when Dr. Demadian uh, was contemplating building an upright MRI, uh, I believe the story is that Dr. Smith told him that, well, if you build one, I will buy one, <laughs> which, uh, and I think the rest is history. So uh, Dr. Francis Smith, uh, please proceed. Good morning, and thank you for that kind introduction, Jay. I'd also like to thank Dr. Demadian for inviting me to come to New York to talk to you. Um, I love coming to New York, so it was uh, a great pleasure to be here. And what I'm here to, to do today is really to set the scene, uh, the basic anatomy that we're going to be looking at, uh, and to maybe engender a little thought amongst ourselves as to why the medical profession is so slow in adopting new techniques um, which are clearly have the advantage of giving us more information um, but which are, are slightly out of the mainstream. So let me first see if we... I have to thank Dr. Harshfield for providing me with some of the, the material. Uh, he unfortunately can't be here to make his presentation, um, so I, I acknowledge uh, his help. And if we go to medicine for, 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 for centuries, the art of medicine has been, by taking a good clinical history and by observation, um, by physical examination, and most times if you ask the patient, they will tell you what is wrong with them. You ask the right questions and you listen, and you will find out what's wrong with them. But over the last 20 years, with the rapid advance in technology, the development in, in basic radiology, in X-ray CT technology, and in MRI technology, more and more of us have become dependent upon uh, the imaging uh, facility that you would, we have available to us. Um, I tell my residents that they treat the patient and not the image. What today I want us to start to look at the image a little more closely and recognize things that we have often taken for granted or haven't understood and therefore have ignored. Why do we persist in imaging the, the lumbar spine, for instance, or the cervical spine in the recumbent position when we always visualize it and interpret it in the upright position? Never mind the fact that, that many of the patients who come to us have problems in the spinal axis which are worst when they are in the upright position. So I've never fully understood why the majority of the world still persists in, in imaging uh, the cervical spine, the lumbar spine in the lying down position. As Dr. Dworkin said, I, said, I did say to Dr. Demadian, you build it, I'll buy it. I didn't know where I was going to get the money, but I received a, a generous grant from the Scottish government in uh, 1990 to do this and installed what I believe was the second of the prototypes uh, from, from the Phonar uh, system. The recumbent image, you can image the individual standing and you can see that there is difference. You can image them sitting, and you can again see there's difference in the appearance. We can do them standing, sitting, we can flex them and we can extend them, and we learn a great deal about both the lumbar spine and the cervical spine. Just look at these two images. Same individual, imaged within 10 minutes, recumbent and sitting and you can see the effects of gravity on the body. Never mind on the spine. You can see she's a nice young lady. When she's recumbent, she has a nice flat scaphoid abdomen, and when she sits, it all falls down. 
<laughs> if we look in the neck, and we have the same recumbent on the left-hand side and sitting, in fact, we have an extended picture, but the individual is sitting, what I would like you to look at are the jugular veins. The most striking difference between the two images is the appearance of the jugular veins. But when you're lying down, the jugular vein doesn't drain as fast and therefore appears large. And on the right-hand side, when the patient's upright, draining faster, you see that the jugular vein or the jugular veins are much smaller. Never mind the, the difference in appearances of the two intervertebral discs that are not quite as healthy as they should be and for which the examination was being performed, the degree of prolapse is, is far more evident in the upright position uh, with the neck extended. But I think when we're going to be talking about CSF flow, blood flow around the craniocervical junction, remember these two images and see, see the difference between the venous drainage from the brain um, in the differences between the recumbent and the upright position. We all learnt our anatomy from Gray's anatomy and when you go and look at the images they're, they're pretty basic um, and there have been significant advances in the world of anatomy in the last 20 years with more careful dissection of different parts of the body and a better understanding of how the connective tissues flow together um, that in fact uh, Gray when he looked at his cadavers and, and drew his pictures, uh, they were pretty crude pictures by comparison with our modern understanding of anatomy. And we can now create images in textbooks to teach our students um, the correct uh, relationship between ligaments and the dura, uh, ligaments and muscle, ligaments and, and the, the bones of, of the cervical junction. I'd like you to kind of remember this picture because this is what we are looking at when we make our MRI images uh, to better understand some of the uh, pathologies that have been difficult to understand uh, hitherto. I'm not going to teach you your anatomy. You know your anatomy around here. You, um, what I want to demonstrate is that you can actually see the anatomy that you learnt from the textbook. Um, you maybe didn't dissect this uh, when you were coming through med school uh, in, in as much detail, but you certainly know uh, the names of these ligaments, where they arise from and where they attach. If we come and look at the, the craniocervical junction, I want you to remember the, the apical ligament running from the, the top of the odontoid peg and the two wings, the two alar ligaments, um, which join the peg to the, um, the, the, the base of the skull. And it is possible with MRI to actually go in and look at them. I don't have a pointer, but we have arrows on here. You can read as well as I can speak. And you can see that in the axial images, through the craniocervical junction, you can see the normal uh, transverse ligament. You can see in the coronal view I'm not going to mess. I'm not going to mess. Okay. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not going to mess with it. Um, you, but, but, but you can see as well. I've, I've put the arrows on. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 and what you'll notice is that they're not in red, because there will be about three or four of us in this room who are colorblind, and uh, and they won't uh, and won't see it in red. Okay. Um, and again, when we look at the transverse band of the, of the cruciform ligament. Um, you can again see very clearly uh, the, the ligaments. 
I'm not going to show you pathology because I don't want to steal the thunder of, of, of others who are coming after me to speak. Dr. Rosa is going to speak in detail about, uh, about these ligaments and, and how he c you can see changes uh, in the MRI appearance which are of, of clinical significance. And as the Chinese say, a little picture tells a th a th is worth a thousand words. If we look at, uh, at the bottom of the two ligaments, the sagittal section through the alar ligament, marked with two arrows, appearing black because of the, the uh, makeup of the ligament. And if we look in the next slide in, in someone who has suffered a whiplash injury, you can actually see the increase in, in signal within it. Um, this is swollen, it has been chewed, it has been damaged in the whiplash injury. Now I would venture to suggest that uh, Dr. Bogduk, who is a well-known biomechanics expert who said, I can't believe that the entire population of people who have been in an automobile accident have contrived together to try and defraud the insurance companies of the world. But I would be venture to suggest that this patient, had they had a regular MRI in a center that was not particularly interested in looking at the small ligaments around the craniosophical junction, would have had an MRI which was reported as being essentially normal. I think that, that many of us do not look at these small ligaments. We rather concentrate on the larger ligaments that we'll look at in a short while. Look at the intervertebral discs. Look to see if there's been a fracture. Look to see if there's been some hemorrhage uh, around one of the longitudinal ligaments or intervertebral uh, disc. But we do not look at these small uh, ligaments in detail. And yeah, I don't believe that the world has contrived to defraud the insurance companies. I believe that, that the, these patients are, are, are by and large very genuine and they have underreported MRI examinations. A nice picture in the mid sagittal plane of the apical ligament. And you can see the, the membrane, the anterior atlantoaxial uh, membrane very clearly. So these ligaments are there to be seen. What I suggest is that I and my other radiological colleagues who understand this uh, need to educate our colleagues uh, into looking in more detail uh, at the smaller ligaments uh, because when they are damaged, they cause symptoms. A nice normal sagittal MRI examination of a normal cervical spine. And <coughs> if you go through them one by one, you can see the different structures um, clearly. And these will be visible in any good midline sagittal section produced on any MRI system in the world. It's a matter of being aware that they are there and potentially may be damaged. And you need to be observant. You need to be aware that they can be damaged because if you don't know it exists, you won't see it. So what we are doing today is, is, is hoping that it makes more of us aware that it is possible on MRI to demonstrate these small ligaments uh, around the craniosophical junction. If we then look at someone who has been a, in in a whiplash injury, has been in a motor vehicle accident, you can see that the interspinous ligaments posteriorly, um, which we can see here with the open arrows, up, up, up above the normal appearance of the interspinous ligament, poor signal, has been damaged at these two levels, the increase in, in signal behind appearing white, and you can see disruption uh, See, I knew that would happen if I started to be clever. <laughs> uh, um, come back. And you can see how the, the interspinous ligaments and, and the ligamentum flavum 
have been damaged at this, these two levels. Everybody recognized very clearly the fracture to the body of C5, um, but many people don't notice the more subtle appearances uh, of, of the ligaments. We, we're all taught that an increased signal anteriorly in someone who's had a recent whiplash injury indicates there's been some hemorrhage. Yes, there's been hemorrhage, but why is the hemorrhage? In other words, which ligament has been damaged? Uh, which blood vessels have been damaged as a result of the, of the rupture or tear of that ligament? So we need to be more vigilant and look in the more detail at, uh, at what is truly damaged. And here we have someone else who's been in a whiplash in, in a, in a mo motor vehicle accident, and you can see very nicely the torn posterior atlantoaxial membrane, right? Number eight. Um, anteriorly, everything is intact, but you can see a lot of prevertebral hemorrhage. Um, if we come up and then look at the atlantoaxial level, uh, you can see at, at two, the anterior aspect of the, of the ligament has been torn, there's wide separation. And I would venture to suggest that very often we say, yeah, there's been a, he there's been a severe uh, hemorrhage, um, the vertebral bodies are fine, there's no fracture there, um, they're all nicely aligned, um, the patient will settle down. But in fact, when you look closely, we have uh, torn portions of the anterior atlanto uh, occipital membrane. We've got a big uh, torn posterior aspect to the same membrane. And this must have an influence on the way we manage the patient thereafter. A young lad who was, uh, who was in the car accident and in the axial view, you can see at four an intact transverse ligament, but the alar ligament, right, the normal alar ligament is number three, uh, it's between three and two. And let me see if I can get this to work again. Right here we've got the normal alar ligament, remember we saw, saw that earlier, sitting between the, the dens and, and, the, uh, and the lateral mass, and on this side it has been, it has been torn and is surrounded by CSF. Yet, the transverse ligament is still intact. So there is detail there that we often either don't see or we ignore because we don't fully understand what is happening. We can get in a little closer and look at some of the membranes around the, the foramen magnum. And in the top image, number A, you can see that the, uh, come across the, to the right, anteriorly, you can see that the tectorial membrane, uh, can I borrow that bill, thank you. Yeah, 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 right. Right, <coughs> here we've got the anterior te tectorial membrane um, shown very clearly. Um, and you can see in the double arrows the posterior ligament, whereas uh, if we look down at, at number at B, um, the posterior ligament where it's been damaged appears gray by comparison with, with this nice normal uh, appearance here. So again, we have to go in and remember that there is more to the anatomy at this level than the ligaments and the bones, um, that there are membranes, there is the dura to consider. Um, I'll show you another one, and I'll let you read it through. Um, you can see that the, if you look at the double arrow here, where the, the two come together, they appear thickened, whereas in the, uh, in the, this one where there has been a whiplash injury, you can see that this continuity at this level 
So you compare this with this. Well, here we have the normal, here we have a, tor a tear. Similarly here, again, there's, there's been disruption. And these, these are contiguous sections showing the extent of the, of the damage. So it, it's a matter of paying attention to detail and making sure that you have the correct equipment and the correct pulse sequences uh, to demonstrate the anatomy. As well as working in the, doing a little bit of neuroradiology, I'm primarily a musculoskeletal radiologist. And uh, a lot of my patients, I look after a professional soccer team, and a lot of my patients have groin pain. And the, the groin is a very good analogy with, with what happens at the craniosurbical junction where the different ligaments run into each other. If you go to Gray's anatomy, it says that the rectus abdominis muscle is attached to the top of the, the, pu uh, the, the pubis and that the adductor muscles arise from, the from below the symphysis pubis. If you go in and dissect very carefully, you will find that they are in continuity and run across the, run across the pubic bone. So if you damage your adductor muscles, you're likely to have lower abdominal pain and vice versa. Um, and so it's no surprise to me that when we come to the craniocervical junction, where we've got, uh, we've got ligaments holding everything together, we have the dura mater holding the, the brain in the, in, inside the cranium, that the two must at some time meet. And in fact, they do um, at the so-called myodural bridge. And this is kind of neat, subtle anatomy. Um, and it's a particular interest to uh, the chiropractic pr uh, practitioners who understand this. Um, and their knowledge of this region uh, is used in, in, in their different uh, treatments. Um, and, and this is just saying what I've rabbited on about. But that where the, where the dura, where the dura comes down, there has to be a bridge between that and the, the uh, rectus capitus posterior minor, which you all know very well. Um, there's this, this bridge of tissue between the dura and the muscle coming down to attach to, the, the, uh, to C1. Can we see that with MRI? Yes, of course we can see it with MRI. And if we look here, you can see pretty much like the image I just showed, we've got the dura coming down. We have the, the muscle here, and we have the bridge sitting in between. We have, and I've tried to orientate it in the same direction. Here we have the, uh, the first cervical vertebra. Here we have the uh, occipital bone. We have the dura here. We have muscle coming in across here. And here we have the myodural bridge. Now, I'm not going to talk in any more detail about this because I, I'm sure that Dr. Rosa will be telling us uh, more about it um, and its importance. And just again to show the schematic on the right-hand side against an MRI examination. If you know what you're looking for, you will see it. And this is just to uh, remind us that we're going to move on to the tonsils. And again, the effects of gravity must come into play. You have a brain within a a tight, confined space, sitting in cerebrospinal fluid, there's no way that it's going to be rigid. We all think it's rigid because we learnt our anatomy from cadaveric specimens that had been cured in formaldehyde, had become solid, and we just thought that they were pretty much uh, a solid organ within, within a bony cavity. Um, the advent of MRI allowed us to, to 
understand in more detail what the normal living anatomy was doing, and I believe the ability to image in the position that we spend all our waking hours in um, allows us to understand even better what is happening to the normal anatomy. And you can see subtle changes in someone who's got tonsils that are just sitting at the foramen magnum between a neutral upright and a neutral recumbent position. <coughs> They're subtle. And also, I have to remind ourselves that it's very difficult to get exactly the same millimeter th thick slice through exactly the same section in the body each time. So we do have partial volume problems to contend with. We do have perception problems to, to deal with. But in significant pathology, I think you will see that there is a, a very marked difference in the appearance of the, uh, of the um, tonsils at the, at the uh, foramen magnum, especially in, 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 in patients with Chiari 1 uh, abnormality. I'd like to present a case that, that's lent to me by my colleague Jean-Pierre Elsig from Zurich. Um, there's a 50-year-old woman who has neck pain. She's had a regular MRI scan in the recumbent position, probably at one and a half or three Tesla. Um, and it demonstrates that she has a cervical disc. But her symptoms are those of transient paresthesia, loss of muscle tone in her legs from time to time, and drop attacks. <coughs> and these cannot be... These cannot be... Uh, explained by this disc, which you'll see in a moment protrudes posteriorly when she uh, stands up. So if we, if they, this is the level that she was diagnosed as having the problem, where in fact, if you look up here, you see she's got a Chiari 1, which becomes very much more evident in the upright position. So we're not so stupid wanting to image in the upright position. We're actually seeing things as they actually are when people are suffering from their problem. And I think this is a wonderful case because it does illustrate how, yeah, it's maybe something there, but when they stand up, it's very definitely a, a disc problem. But hey, let's look up at the craniocervical junction. So that the upright... Uh, scan shows a position-dependent uh, movement and herniation uh, of the tonsils. So this is very interesting. A lot of people suffer, as we heard. 1.2 million individuals in the United States have suffered a whiplash injury in the last 12 months. Um, is there some way that, that we as radiologists, or me as a radiologist, can help? Um, and we know that it we know about Chiari 1 malformations, and, and I'm not going to teach you how to suck eggs, as it were. Um, <laughs> but just for completeness, I'll remind us about Chiari 1 and Chiari 2. And uh, yes, the diagnosis on MRI. And I remember in the very early days when Bill and I were starting out that there was a sudden increase in the diagnosis of Chiari 1 malformation. In fact, when I was a resident, it was, it was a relatively rare condition. We get MRI, we get the midline sagittal ability, and hey, this, thing, this disease has suddenly increased. Um, and we used to measure and see how far the tonsils would go through the frame and magnum. And if it were more than, I, I can't remember how many it was, five millimeters, then it was significant. Um, so the threshold for di diagnosis is very variable. Um, Others have suggested that the range of normal tonsil position is just two millimeters above the line drawn between the, the uh, occiput and the, uh, yeah, the frame and back and the basi opsithion op op line, um, which is a wonderful word. Um, so some people say two millimeters, some people say five millimeters. Um, and so there's a lot of work has been done in this. It's not clear how 
trauma plays a role in the activation of symptoms that are attributable to this kind of uh, malformation. Um, they may be co coincidental or may be awakened by the trauma or, or may be caused by the trauma. And, you know, cervical whiplash, is it a coincidence that you get Chiari malformation? I doubt it. Correlation or causation? Um, so we decided that we would go out and look at this. And there's a group of us, and you can see what we do, uh, who decided that we would work together to try and uh, see if upright imaging would give us some clues. So we did a case control study. Um, it's a kind of neat study because we enrolled 1,200 patients into the, uh, into the study. They were all older than 18. They had presented to four different centers over a three-year period. And we reviewed, the, we reviewed the examinations. Half of the scans, 600 of them, were acquired in the upright position. And the other half were obtained in the recumbent position in a similar field strength uh, open MRI. Now we further divided those two groups of 600 into 300 individuals who had been in a road traffic accident and the other 300 had not been in, a, had no recent history of trauma but were being investigated for other reasons. So we have four groups. We have a recumbent group, no trauma, recumbent group who've been in a road traffic accident and the same in the upright position. So we got four groups of 300. Um, and the images were interpreted by two radiologists, one who was remote by 5,000 miles, um, and I knew nothing about the clinical history or the scanner type. Um, and we scored them by looking to see the degree of prolapse below the the BO line. Very simple. And we scored them that if they were uh, more than five millimeters above, then it was plus three, and if they were more than five millimeters below, it was minus three. Um, we did all the things that we're supposed to do. We, we did an ANOVA, uh, we did a chi-squared, we did kappa statistics. And of the 1,200 scans, there were five of them which the two radiologists didn't believe were of diagnostic quality, um, and we, we dropped them out. Um, so with the average age is, is 40, essentially, and a little bit older in the non-trauma group. Interestingly, the majority of the subjects were ladies. Um, and there was good agreement between the two radiologists on either side of the pond. Um, and here we can see all the data, but what is important is the, what happens when we analyzed it. And in the recumbent non-trauma group, the mean tonsillar station was way above the frame and magnum. The upright non-trauma group was also well above, but the recumbent trauma group showed that there was a slight, slightly lower level of the tonsils, and in the upright trauma group, it, they were even lower. <coughs> so these are the mean results of the 1,200 less five individuals in the four separate groups. Um, true ki Chiari malformations were rare in all the groups, fortunately, and we thought there were probably six cases of that, and interestingly, they were well spread between the, the trauma and non-trauma groups, which made the statistics uh, easy. So in the two non-trauma groups, the tonsils were uh, below th the frame and magnum in 50, well, between, uh, yeah, 
5.7 and 5.3 of the cases. Whereas in the trauma group, the tonsils were below the foramen magnum in 9.5 and 23.7 uh, of the cases, right? 9.5 in the recumbent position, but when we stood them up, 23.7 actually had tonsils that went through the foramen magnum. And this stood up statistically very well. So, and this is, a, I don't like this slide because it used to be in color and was easy to look at. Um, but essentially, so this is the upright trauma group. And uh, yes, so the, 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 this is the upright trauma group. Um, and, and, and this is below the frame and magnum, right? At or below the frame and magnum, and then above the frame and magnum. And you can see that in the upright position, um, we see very definitely that there is something happening. And when they lie down, um, you don't see it. So to summarize that, if you have not been traumatized and you're imaged in the recumbent or the upright position, there is very little difference in the degree of herniation of your cerebellar tonsils. Whereas if you've been in a whiplash injury, you may, get a, you may pick it up in the recumbent position in that about twice that number show up. But in the upright position, 76% of patients who had been traumatized showed a degree of prolapse of their cerebellar tonsils. So the question remains, is it because they had some asymptomatic condition before? I think that's unlikely. Our best explanation was that the findings were the result of the injury. And there has been some indication that there is a causal relationship between whiplash injury and continued fibromyalgic pain. Um, but I'm not going to go to this in more detail because, again, my chiropractic colleague will be able to help us with that. So it's very interesting that we have been missing significant pathology by not looking for it in the correct way. I'm laboring the point here. We're going to go on later on, and I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, Dr. Alperin and Dr. Bradley on the dynamics of, of cerebrospinal fluid. Um, it's something that has fascinated me since 1981 when I first noticed that there was some difference in the appearances of the fluid in the aqueduct uh, between different sections and realized that it must be related to the cardiac cycle. Um, but the two experts that we have here have taken that a, a long way forward. And I say, uh, I'm not going to steal anyone's thunder. I'm going to stop now. And uh, hopefully we're running to time. And for maybe ahead of time. Um, and if I will be here until half past four this afternoon if ever anyone wants to ask me anything. Otherwise, you can uh, contact me through my, my new business venture in London uh, where we're putting in an upright scanner uh, for Med Serena. I thank you for your attention.